welcome to Accountable, where your business is our business. Hosted by David R. Peters. Today's guest is Will Hill. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Accountable, the podcast for CFOs by a CFO. One of the more tricky relationships that is in every CFO's life is their relationship with their auditor. Ultimately, I think that CFOs and auditors are basically working towards the same thing. They both want accurate, fairly presented financial statements. I don't know that any CFO would disagree that they want accurate financial statements. I don't think that any CFO is out there saying, I really hope that my financial statements are are not accurate, that uh, that we're not a clean company. Um, I don't think that CFOs say that. I think ultimately CFOs, that that's what they want. They may use their financial statements in a different way uh, than an auditor would. They may look at their financial statements in a different way, trying to plan out strategy and things like that. However, ultimately, if you think about it, at least at a high level, I think that CFOs and auditors really kind of want the same thing. So my question is, is why is that relationship Why is it so tricky? And why, at times, does it feel sort of adversarial? As a CFO, I can tell you that the relationship that I have had with auditors in the past has, at times, felt like we were working towards uh, towards different things. We were working against each other, it felt like, at times. And my question is, is, does it have to be that way? Now, let me be clear. Auditors have to remain independent, and CFOs want their auditors to remain independent because if they're not independent, then their their opinion on the financial statements doesn't mean anything, okay? I mean, if I have an auditor come in and give a an opinion on the financial statements and they're not independent, then that's that's nothing to me. I want my auditor to be independent, and auditors need to remain independent. So I'm not talking about anything that sort of goes against that. I mean, just to be clear. But is there a way where CFOs and auditors can sort of work together and where there's kind of more of a value add in that relationship so that the company can get better? Is there a way to do that? Is there a way that auditors and CFOs can can work together a little bit more towards, towards more of a common good? And if they can, what does that look like and what sort of value could they really add? My guest this week on Accountable is Will Hill, and Will is the Customer Proposition Strategy Lead at Thomson Reuters. He's a great guy, and and one of the things that I think that uh, he and I have found common ground on is this particular issue, is how can CFOs and auditors work together so that uh, so that, that relationship, uh, well, there's more value for the company that comes out of that relationship. How can that happen, and what does that look like? So it's this is a little bit of a unique conversation. I don't hear too many uh, auditors or too many CFOs talking about this, but I think it's an interesting topic to explore. So let's do that now. Enjoy my conversation with Will Hill. My guest this week on Accountable is Will Hill. Will, thanks so much for being here. Hey, thanks, David. Pleasure to be here. So this week, we get a chance to talk about something that uh, I think that a lot of CFOs, a lot of financial leaders, uh, they they experience all the time. But it's one of those things that I'm not sure that we do particularly well. I am not sure that we as CFOs, we as finance leaders, we involved in the accounting industry, I'm not sure that we do a very good job of being business partners. And I I wonder, I think some of it stems from maybe a hesitancy on our end to ask for help. Um, You know, why is it so hard, or is it hard, I guess, 
uh, for CFOs to, to ask for help. Is, is that been your experience too, that CFOs just struggle to ask for help? <laughs> you know, that is over my 20 plus years working in the accounting industry, my perspective is much more from the accounting firm side, than right. the straight CFO side. And, and I've heard that same issue, right? Saying, I, I don't know what they really want. And, and I think that one of the things that's consistent, whether it be a CFO or um, someone that's high up in an accounting firm, is that you got to be pretty smart to be there. Like, right. most people are not dumb and a CFO. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I did. I did leave the most just in case someone in your audience <laughs> to come to mind. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Give them an out. But, um, you know, and in a lot of ways in an organization, the CFO, they're kind of on that island, right? They're, they're yeah. accountable yep. for a lot of stuff. Right. And in some groups, they've got a team to help them get there. In other groups, though, they don't. They're, they're their own person. They may have some bookkeepers that are helping with very transactional stuff, but the rest of it, it sits on their shoulders. And we get, we get used to this independent sense of this is my responsibility. I've got to do this. And, and so to reach out to someone and say, hey, how do we, how can you help me get this done? Is very kind of almost counterculture for a CFO in that case to, to do that. And, and their assumption is, hey, this person at the accounting firm that I'm working with, they're a smart person too. If I need to know something, they're going to tell me. Right. And so, you know, it's, it, I, I think there's a lot of that mentality that plays into some of the interesting uh, relationships that are there. I, I, you t touched on a couple of things and I'm actually really glad, uh, you, you said that in the way that you did, I, I think some of it has to do with ego. I mean, you know, the fact is, is that, uh, you know, a lot of times you're correct. I mean, CFOs, they're kind of on an Island, same thing with partners in accounting firms too, folks. I mean, I, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, that that's, you know, a reach that you're, you're kind of on an Island. You're kind of expected to be right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I do think that that's that that's something uh, that there's something to that. How does that affect how does that mentality affect business relationships? Uh, you know, you you uh, you and I talked a little bit uh, before we before we hit record here about uh, the relationship between audit firms and uh, CFOs. So, so sort of the internal accountants. How does that sort of translate that sort of this, uh, you know, this kind of uh, being on the island, uh, you know, kind of mentality? How does that translate to business relationships with outside firms? Well, I think what, what it does is it sets up a construct where they are not prepared yeah. or thinking it makes sense to go in with this partnership mentality. So um, I, I think a lot of it, if you go to some education theory, um, you've got fixed mindset and growth mindset, right? right? And I think that in that kind of relationship introduction, it's heavily weighted on that fixed mindset. I know my stuff. You know your stuff. Why do we have to intermingle with one another? What's, what's the purpose? We're just right. going to slow each other down. Right. But the reality is that both the CFO and whoever, whether it's the owner of an accounting firm, or it's a lead auditor that's working through, no matter what service is being performed there, they've got a unique skill set. However, mm -hmm. they really have a unique perspective. Right. And it's, it's a matter of saying, how can I get further? I need different perspective. And I, I think the mistake we subconsciously make is, well, if I need to get further, I need different skills. Mm. No, pr probably not because maybe you use it once. I don't know if it really help you in the long run. What you need is a different perspective. Yeah. And that's got to be around a shared goal. And there's, there's another thing is how does the relationship start? And some of that isn't up to the CFO, especially depending on the size of the business, maybe up to the business owner or the board, whatever it may be to say, look, our arrangement with this firm is to do service X. That's all that matters. And, and so if the relationship is started that way, you've got to recognize that. And I say you to either side of that fence to say, how has the relationship started? 
And if it is started in such a way that it's just to do the service, you, you've got to decide, is it worth pushing against that? If you're the accounting firm, I think it's totally worth pushing against that and say, hey, yeah, we're here to do the service. But what is the service in service to? Right. What's the end objective? What are you trying to do? Where are you trying to go? And this, I need that perspective mm-hmm. from the CFO, what they're really trying to do, where they're really trying to take the business, where they see obstacles. I'm not just there to go through the books and point out the mistakes. I'm there to, to lend my perspective on different opportunities that they could take to reach that goal. And it may not be in that same service line, but it's there to bring those perspectives together. Is it, I'm going to play devil's advocate here for a minute because, uh, you know, I think that's uh, for so long, um, or, or maybe just, maybe this is just me. I will, I have no idea, but, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, at least from my training and from my interactions with audit firms, is it possible for an audit firm to truly be kind of a, a partner to a CFO? I mean, aren't we supposed to be enemies I mean, isn't that true? I mean, uh, am I not supposed to like, you know, kind of wrestle for position uh, with my with my audit firm? You know, as you said that, I I remember a conversation I had with um, and she was she's an accountant and also a lawyer, which is a dangerous combination. Um, And uh, but she was talking to me about some work that she had done for a business. And it was actually a nonprofit and where they had found some repeated issues and it was, it really came down to a personnel issue. And she just talked about how it was interesting dynamic because she felt compelled to bring this to the board. It was the right thing to do. And of course, being a lawyer, she was certainly going to do the right thing. Sure. I don't do lawyers listen to your show. We're going to... I tell lawyer jokes sometimes. I don't know. But, (laughs) um, you know, and and it was something where she was new on the job, new to that particular audit. Clearly, the prior auditors had missed it because this is a a pattern, a patterned behavior that was going on. And the board didn't want to see it because they didn't view the relationship that way. All they saw is, oh, now I got a headache. (laughs) I got to deal with this person. We don't like to hire and <laughs> and deal with that. Just just go back to doing just the audit that we we brought you in for. And so, to me, you've got to really decide what is it there for. Right. And if if you've decided that the audit relationship for you is simply to make sure you didn't make any issues and that's it, okay, I guess you can get that. But how far will that take you? You know, if you're if you're the CFO and you've you've got a target on your head, that might be a bad pun. Um, but you've you've got you've got a target that you're accountable for of seven percent growth. Don't you think that the auditors looking through things could find opportunity, not just issues? Right. Um, and to say, hey, while you're looking there. What's what's our threshold for cash leaking out of this business? Might not be a mistake. It just might be bad decisions that might be recorded perfectly well, but they came from bad decisions. Don't I want someone to identify that and raise a flag and go, we're making some bad business decisions. If right. we make some different decisions, you're going to be better off at your 7% target. But again, it and that's where I think that if the accounting firm, I, I firmly believe the accounting firm needs to get more aggressive with leading the relationship, right? So that that audit partner needs to come in and say, hey, we're going to see if there's any issues like you paid us to do. But I also want to know, what are the top three hurdles that you're facing right now as a business and where you're trying to go? Yep. Where are some opportunities that you see uh, areas for growth for you in the next two years? Those are conversations that I think need to be had to give more context, right? And you know, from an auditor perspective, I am not an auditor, by the way. A little bit of a little bit of background back at a bank one time, but that's a whole other story. Right. Uh, but um, you know, from that auditor perspective, if they don't hear any context, they're here to go cash, AR, AP, uh, inventory. Who's here tomorrow? Right. Like right. that's that's their job. Right. But if the audit partner comes in and says, "Hey, we're going to do our audit. 
but also keep your eyes open. Here's right. some things that they're trying to do. Let's see if we can find something to help them get there. They think they're leaking cash, not because of misregarded entries, but because of bad business decisions, perhaps. Let's see if we can find some opportunities. Now, as a staff owner, I'm more engaged. There's, there's something to that say, oh, I get to help them out. I get to find, not just find an error against my training, but find an opportunity for something to get better, to improve. That's exciting. That's dynamic. And I think that um, that's a perspective that the accounting firm needs to lead in that relationship. I don't think, for the most part, you're going to find the CFO, unless they're also the owner, <laughs> coming and volunteering that unless you as the firm have set precedent for that's how we operate when we operate together. I, I think all of those things, I think, are very well said. And and just to be clear for folks, too, I mean, we're not what we're saying here is not anything that goes against independence, right? I mean, it's 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 something where, you know, the the auditor can offer a specialized skill set that can also help the company grow and be better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you think it, folks, I, I picked on inventory an internship at a manufacturing plant where I was like free climbing steel coils. I look back <laughs> on it now. I'm pretty sure OSHA was upset if they were there. And I'm surprised I didn't die, quite frankly. But yeah, uh, you probably shouldn't be 18 feet up in the air, free climbing coils of steel. I'm just just a thought. That's but, uh, we 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 give out lots of advice here on Accountable, and that that is a a piece of advice for uh, for our listeners this week. Right. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it, so many of your auditors have seen other things in play, and so why not bring that to bear? So if you're going right. and you're really struggling to reconcile the inventory, and you go, here here's what happened. You sit there and you go, oh man, why couldn't you be like the guy last month? Their inventory system was slick. Help them implement it. Tell, hey, yeah. here's an idea. You need a new inventory system. Uh, here's some things we've seen in other places. There's nothing wrong with your inventory today. But wow, this is going to give not just me as the auditor better insight. But if I'm struggling to get inside with your inventory, we have to believe that's, help, that's also a hindrance with the business as well. So just being able to say, I've got, I've got experience with other clients. I got to bring that to the table for this client. Two, say, what have I seen that's worked well? Where, does, where was I not frustrated when I was working with a different client? And how can I bring that solution in? Which certainly, again, is not an independence issue. But, um, I, I, think, uh, I think all those things are well said. I would also say, too, from the CFO side, I'm not sure that we necessarily step into auditor relationships uh, with kind of the right mindset. I mean, I'll admit, I mean, uh, you know, especially... Uh, you know, most of my background is in is in startup companies. And when it's a startup company and it's yours and you kind of see it go from nothing into something, it's your baby. And and so when an auditor comes in, it's almost feels like it's like this this person's trying to find something wrong with my baby, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, and I and I'm very I, I'm automatically I am I am charged up right away. Um, and I probably am not necessarily maybe as open to the feedback as as I could be. You know what that screams to me, David, is that we don't ha we have a possible misalignment on goal and purpose. Right. And so one of the things we you know I, I talk about quite a bit as I work with firms at Thomson Reuters is just hey you need to make sure when you engage with your customers you have great clarity of engagement. And I'm not talking about they might read the fine print of this five page engagement letter that they sign hurriedly after we tell them what the price is. Like I'm talking about, Hey, this is, this is the expectation. If we have success, this is what success looks like. So you as the owner of the startup, if someone comes in and says, Hey, let's paint what success looks like together, different perspective than get your hands off my baby. Right. Yeah, no doubt about it. And and I think and I think too that that is, you know, probably what we should be be targeting more is kind of overall success. And 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 folks, I, you know, if you've if you're like me, I've never been an an auditor. Um I I went uh, the the tax road and then uh, you know, got into industry and um you know, I I can tell you that uh, you know, that there there is uh you know, there is power, there is uh, you know, strategy, there is 
better business that can be found by listening to folks that are coming in with an outside perspective. I think at least on some level, we all get blinders, especially when it comes to our business. We kind of get we kind of get used to stuff and um, and we kind of maybe aren't uh, we, we just don't see things uh, all the time where I think I think what I hear you saying is, is that an uh, that uh, the auditor, it's not just about skill set. It's about uh, personality perspective. It's it's just another point of view. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, there's a, uh, I'm probably going to botch this right now because it's been a while since I've read the book, but uh, Crucial Conversations, a very well-known business book in terms of handling conversations when the stakes are high. And there's a difference between getting what you want and getting your way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we talk about the personalities of a CFO or that, that lead bookkeeper that's trying to prove themselves to the owner versus someone in the accounting firm coming in from the outside. If we don't look at what are we trying to get instead of I want my way to prove that I'm right and I'm capable, we're going to have a very different path and a very different end result. Right. Yeah. Um, let's try to kind of kind of uh, uh, help folks uh, kind of maybe give some folks some rules of thumb about sort of how do we form better auditor client relationships? How do we do this kind of on both sides of the ball? Are there any sort of like rules of thumb uh, that you can uh, maybe point to uh, maybe on the audit side that maybe auditors could do? Um, we'll start there. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, I've already said this once, but what are the client goals? If you don't right. understand the goals of the client's business, then I think you're missing a good deal of context for what's going on during the audit process. And you're missing the opportunity to truly help, you know, and, and as an auditor, you've got to remember that, that you are not there to find evil, right? You yeah. are there to help them. Right. And in, in this case, a lot of times the help is a, a insurative and protective type help, right? It's a little bit of a defensive play, uh, yeah. if you will, but right. in the end, you're there to help them. Right. And, if you don't know where they're going or why they're going in a certain direction, how, how do you help effectively? And so I, I think that's something that um, has to be done from the lead of the audit team down, right? You're not, you got, a, you got an audit staff member that goes out and does all the cash stuff while they're on site, but signs nothing. Hey, that's great. But if, the audit partner up above, that senior manager that's there, if they're not illustrating, hey, here are the client goals, here are the things we can look for, and using this as that teaching opportunity to connect dots, we're, mi we're missing out, right? It's, it's got to be from the whole team. You can't just hope that someone cares. I think uh, I think on the CFO side too. I think uh, you know a rule of thumb I, I would maybe point to is just uh, you know it's just kind of. Um, making sure that uh, you're looking at uh, audits as opportunities, not a chance to sort of, uh, you know, it's not just it's not just criticism for the sake of criticism. It's a chance to get better. Um, I'll, I'll give you a, a, an example. I know that, um, you know, when we uh, when I was uh, working uh, for uh, Compare.com, I was, uh, you know, we were just getting started. Uh, we were in a brand new industry. I mean, uh, there really wasn't sort of a price comparison company for auto insurance rates really in the United States kind of before that. And, um, you know, the first audit, uh, you know, it was it was uh, it was maybe a chance. And I'm not sure that I, I necessarily sort of fully embraced it at the time. But, uh, you know, it was really a chance for us to sort of get some outside perspective uh, of our business and really help us to get sort of situated so that we could get, we could move forward. I mean, we wanted yeah. to have, we wanted to do it right. I mean, uh, you know, we wanted to have clean processes. We wanted to have good revenue recognition principles. We wanted to make sure that we were in compliance with the rules. We, you know, we wanted that and we wanted the ability to grow and, um, you know, the, the first audit was really a, the, the first time somebody else from the outside, an expert, uh, you know, had come in and really sort of evaluated our operations before that. I mean, you know, especially when, uh, you know, when it's startups, I mean, you're just kind of, you know, scrambling at times, you know, to just kind of get something moving. <laughs> and, yeah. and so so I think that that's, you know, that may be an, an, an example of, you know, kind of maybe the right mentality to have is, is, is to try to use 
that, uh, you know, that experience is, hey, this is a chance for us to get right so that we can move forward. Yeah. And, and sometimes you want to say, hey, who's who's someone else that's just like us and what are they doing? Maybe that's better. And we put too much emphasis on just like us. Right. right. The, the reality should be, hey, auditors, hey, accountant that's helping me with stuff. Um, what are other service based businesses without inventory doing? Right. What are other manufacturing facilities, multiple locations doing? Doesn't matter what they manufacture, all that's irrelevant. It's about the business model. And you can leverage the exposure of the accounting staff from that firm to other companies that have a similar business model and say, give, give me some of that. What are they doing? What's effective? Um, and, and not try to be a, too narrow in where you're willing to pull a best practice from. Right. Yeah, I think that's very true. Very true. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, you, you threw out uh, a book uh, that uh, you had read. Uh, I, I'm going to throw out one of my favorites. And uh, folks who, uh, who know me, uh, you know that I probably talk about this book too much. Uh, there was a, there was a book out uh, a few years ago. It was called The Power of Habit. Uh, it was a New York Times uh, bestseller. Um, I know that I read it. Uh, I was on a flight to who knows where. And, um, I, uh, I got it off of one of those, uh, carousels, right? So I, I still, I still read paper books. Uh, so, um, I, I may, may be one of the, one of the few left, but, uh, but I still read, uh, paper books. And, and in that book, one of the things that they, uh, that they point to is, is, uh, kind of the author's main point is, is that, um, there, th- that we form good habits and we form bad habits and, but they're all just, they're all just habits. the the same sort of uh, so, sort of wiring um, that uh, you know that uh, causes me to grab my running shoes uh, after work every day is the same you know kind of mentality that uh, you know causes me to sit down on the couch and you know watch TV for two hours after I get home uh, after work too. It's all just habits, and I think business relationships I think are very habitual too. And so, you know, if we really kind of want um, our business relationships to be better, I think we have to change along with it. I think we have to look for uh, sort of pos- more positive relationships. And I think that uh, sometimes I think uh, that takes, uh, you know, us kind of, you know, you know, maybe maybe relooking at how how we're engaging with people. Yeah, I, I think along with that, it's it's the subconscious or unconscious habits that are there. So. When, when we talk about how do we engage or how do we start the communication, we don't think of what we're doing today as that habit. Mm-hmm. We just, well, that's the way it is. Right. Well, what if it doesn't have to be that way? And um, we've got to really sit down and, and challenge ourselves to say, I've got to do something different Yeah. and really step way back because it's so easy when I, when I look at people who go through process change, and I spent a number of years traveling to accounting firms, helping them implement business process change in their firms. And most of them would not start soon enough. Hmm. In reality, when they started to evaluate their process by which they were going to look to change, they were in step two or three. Hmm. We're so subconscious or unconscious towards that first step or two in any process, we often miss that. And I think that's where the expectation piece comes in. It's where, how do I set the tone for communication? Um, you know, if you want to all of a sudden in the middle of the audit, you go, oh, we got to talk to the CFO about some great opportunities, but you haven't talked to the CFO the whole time. We have a potential problem <laughs> because the CFO is like, why, why are we talking? Like, right. okay, you got some opportunity, but you've been here for three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't had a single conversation. Why are we talking? And all the value you're trying to bring, you, you've undermined because you didn't start this process at the start of the process. Yeah. Um, and, and you've missed that opportunity. Is there a way to, is, is there a way to, to correct that? Or is it just, uh, is it that just people being people? You know, um, Yes, we do it because we're people. That's the way we are. I think that 
the the way we address that is as a variation or a take maybe on the on the five whys. We keep asking yourself why to kind of come down to a root root cause. Right. Yeah, is to say okay, well, let's map the process out. I'm sure you've done business process mapping before, right? And yeah. and then it's to look at the start and go, is that really where it starts? But wait, how did I get there? Right. And um. And just asking yourself that three times to make sure you're truly at the start, right? Yeah. So I I remember I was doing some business consulting with an accounting firm, and I would I would go and sit with people that had different roles at the firm, analyze their part of the process, and and one of them said, "Well, I start here with the, the client data," and I said, "Well, where did you get it from?" And she looked at me funny, and I knew it right then. She thought that's where the process started, but that wasn't where the process started. It started by someone had to send it to her. Right. Except they didn't send it to her. They sent it somewhere else and then it got printed and then it got put over here. Right. So there were three other steps in this process that they don't consider. They were they were precursors to the actual work that was being done. So we've got really got to step back and analyze that whole flow and say, if I want to set a different tone in this relationship, where does it really start? I think that's a great point. So, Will, I feel like we're just kind of barely scratching the surface here. I think, uh, you know, but uh, I I think, uh, you know, kind of the bottom line to a lot of our listeners out here is that there is room for improvement here between, uh, you know, the the relationship between auditors and CFOs. And a lot of it is, is I think, kind of how we're framing that relationship. And so, uh, so I think that, uh, you know, I think that uh, if, uh, you know, we could maybe point to at least a few takeaways there. I would certainly think that that's, that that's one of them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, when people have a shared goal, they're able to get there faster and stronger. And, you know, the accounting firm, no matter how big they are, their goals really are the success of their clients. Yeah. We lose that that we missed that translation to, well, wait a minute, what does success look like for this client? And it's not the absence of failure. And so I've got to say, hey, our goal here is this client's success. What are you trying to achieve? And and I want to contextually wrap even more information around my day-to-day duties. And, And I've always said that people operate best when they understand the context in which they operate. And I think that this greatly applies in terms of how I can bring more knowledge and value to my customer as a, an auditor or any member of an accounting firm. I think that's a great point. Will, uh, I would be remiss if I did not uh, ask you to talk at least a little bit about your podcast, because you got a killer podcast, and um, I want uh, folks to know about it. So those of you out there that are uh, in uh, accountable land, um, I got to tell you that Will has a great podcast. So could you just tell the folks a little bit uh, about uh, about what you're doing? Sure. Podcast is called Pulse of the Practice. And uh, I co-host it with a gentleman named Paul Miller, who's an accounting firm owner in uh, the state of Minnesota. And we we just try to have some fun. We know that running accounting firms is challenging. It's draining. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of things that, you know, we can wind the clock back to TCJA and forward. It has been a constant movement of the goalposts yeah. <laughs> for accounting firms um, for the last three years. And frankly, it's not going to slow down. And so we look to say, how can we help accounting firm owners bring them some new ideas, be inspirational? Um, because I, I think that at the end of the day, accounting firm owners are in a great position to truly impact their clients' lives. And that's a fantastic thing. And so if we can help inspire them to keep moving forward, to change some things, whether it be around advisory services or just other challenges that they face as a business owner. That's what we try to do and uh, have a number of guests on. Sometimes it's just he and I, but uh, we've been going at it for almost two years. So so a pulse of the practice, folks. Uh, it's a great podcast, uh, and uh, especially if, especially if you're an accounting firm owner. And my goodness, uh, what a what a time to be an accounting firm owner, especially over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, no doubt about it. So um, Will, if folks want to get a hold of you, how would they be able to do that? Well, thankfully, I have the most difficult email address in the company. It is will.hill at tr.com. You don't even have to spell out Thomson Reuters. You can just do tr.com. You can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Will Hill, 
look for the funny looking guy. And that's probably me. That sounds great. Well, Will, thank you so much for being on Accountable. I, I think uh, this is a great conversation and uh, and hopefully one uh, that uh, will help some folks out when uh, the, the next time that uh, that the uh, that the audit firm is ready to step into the firm. Hopefully uh, folks will be, be thinking about this uh, um, when that happens. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, David. Thanks for listening to Accountable. Be sure to subscribe for more interviews and insights from today's business leaders. David Peters is a registered representative offering securities through Satera Advisor Networks, LLC, member FINRA SIPC. Advisory services offered through Carroll Financial Associates, a registered investment advisor. Peters Tax Preparation, David Peters Financial, Carroll Financial, and Satera Advisor Networks are not affiliated. He is located at 8005 C. Creighton Parkway, number 129, Mechanicsville, Virginia, 23111, and can be reached at 800-799-4526. The views depicted in this material are for information purposes only and not necessarily those of Satera. They should not be considered specific advice or recommendations for any individual.